Welcome to Stand in the Gap Today from the American Pastors Network. We proclaim truth in the public square by connecting a biblical worldview and constitutional principles to the most significant news of the day. Simple, careful, and truthful. That's Stand in the Gap Today. Now, here's your host. Welcome to the program. I'm Isaac Crockett, and I'm here today with Sam Rohr, uh, the Honorable Sam Rohr, the president of the American Pastors Network. And as we often do on Fridays, uh, we ask Sam the questions either that have come in from uh, listeners or different folks that we've interacted with in churches or other places, and uh, we compile the, the hard questions. We save them for you, Sam. Uh, save the best for the last day of the week, and uh, not always. They're, sometimes they're just personal questions or some just some question that you know people are curious about. And I would just say, if you're listening right now and you want to ask Sam about something, it doesn't have to be some, you know, really well-drafted question. It could be something really simple or basic, or maybe you're just curious about something personally about him or how he prepares for different programs and things. Uh, we'd, we'd love to, to hear from you, and we'd really like to hear your questions. But Sam, I, I want to kind of uh, phrase, uh, frame the program for today, and I'm going to be looking at, you know, personal reformation and how that personal reformation can bring national revival. And really what has kind of been work, the Lord has been working on in my heart has been uh, the the programs that you've been doing about the 10 steps to national renewal. And I have found them very helpful. You've been doing these uh, on the radio as well as you and I have been covering those same topics, the same, same uh, points on our TV program. And so... Um, and, and let me just also point out to you who, who are listening right now, if you want to go back and listen to programs like those uh, those programs, you can go to standinthegapmedia.org, or you can download our Stand in the Gap app. Our producer, Tim, uh, was just showing me today some of the numbers of the thousands of people who are downloading our app. I love using the, the app. It works on uh, most smartphones, and it's really helpful. You can video or audio. But all of our archives are there. And when I say all of it, I mean lots and lots of archives, hundreds and I guess probably thousands of radio archives and over 100 video archives from our Stand in the Gap TV. So all of that is there if you want to watch those. Many of you have been listening to those and or watching those. But Sam, the, the Lord has been really using that, not just in my life, but in a lot of our listeners' lives. And, uh, and you know, I'm just kind of curious what led you to do that, that to start those programs about the 10 principles, the national renewal. Um, what, what I guess, is it in our nation that makes you think, you know, we don't just need revival. I think every generation is praying for revival, but you think that this is a time that we need, we must have a national renewal. Uh, well, Isaac, that actually started my investigation of those which became those 10 principles. actually started when I was in the Pennsylvania House, and I'm sitting there in the, the General Assembly, and I'm walking the building, and I'm seeing all the Bible verses, and I'm seeing the history actually in the uh, official signing room of the governor in Pennsylvania Capitol. There are pictures across all of the walls. It's, it's hardly very hardly anybody gets to go in that room, but the, it's the history of the conversion of William Penn and shows him being cast out by his parents who didn't agree with his conversion to Christ, to Christianity and so forth. And I, and I began to see all those things. And I'm thinking, wow, this is a tremendous heritage. So I began to read and study more. And then I began to go back and I read the, the, a lot of the treatise and the writings of William Penn, who are founders, even like Jefferson and Franklin referred to him as the father of the founders. And I thought, why was that? Well, in all that work and effort, I've found that without in his, within his writings, he actually went to the basis and said, how do you start this new holy experiment in freedom, he called it. Uh, holy because it's off of God's word, the pages of scripture, an experiment, self-government under God, because it had never been done before. That was the word he used, self-government, this holy experiment. How do you do that? Well, he went through and actually was one of the greatest thought leaders of the time, but actually walked through and from the pages of Scripture, actually identified principles. And as I'm walking through them during that time, I'm saying, you know what, there are some critical principles here. And out of them, I said, you know what, there basically are 10 principles. He didn't cite them that way, um, but they were all there. 
and they were referred to by other founders, and they really became the basis of uh, well, what we would call today a, a biblical worldview. We talk about it on the program. But so, you know, who is God? What is integrity? Virtue, the importance of virtue, the, the nature of man, the depravity of man. If you don't understand that, you can't understand the purpose for government and just law, which he wrote a lot about. And how do you keep those things as checks and balances and so forth? And and, uh, and ultimately leads up to, if you get the thing started and God helps you, how do you keep it going? Well, he said you have to have a virtuous education of the youth. Parents have to give their kids a Christian education. He talked about all of that. So as I'm looking at that, I'm saying, all right, well, that went into the fabric of our founders at the beginning of our country. But you look at those things today, you say, well, does our culture even give any credence to God? No. Truth? No, it's being written by the day. History, well, even our National Archives, like we talked about last week on this program, are rewriting history and saying it's dangerous content to go back and look at uh, the Constitution or the Mayflower Compact. So all of that came out of that. Isaac said, you know what? We need to refresh ourselves with the fact that there is a plan from the pages of Scripture, copied by our founders, that actually, if you do it, becomes God's plan for a blessed nation. It's not accidental that we have a nation that is what it is, and it's also not a problem, not a, well, it's not an accident that we in our country today have such a, a, a love affair with socialism and find it so difficult to say, no, God said there's man and a woman, and that's the end of the question. There's not multiple variances or uh, the fact that, it, yeah, no, you can't kill babies in the womb and get away with it. I mean, so all that being, Isaac, that's why I'm saying we need to reacquaint ourselves as a nation with the fact that we didn't get here by accident. So go back and visit the roadmap. And that's really what it is. It's a roadmap to reacquaint ourselves. Well, we don't need to recreate the wheel. We just need to reacquaint ourselves with the God who never changes and the principles that our founders identified, which are still there, but we have either ignored or think that they're old stuff. Well, they're not old. They're very new. We need to go back there. So that's really the essence in history and why I think we need to revisit those principles. And, and I, I love those principles, and I love what you said. Our freedom isn't here by accident, and uh, there was a design and the purpose of it. So we're looking to the past. We're learning from history, but using it to look forward, uh, looking at history, looking at what the Bible says, and what do we do right now and going forward. Um, what can our listeners do? We just have a few moments here before our break. What can our listeners do to help us spread this message? Well, a couple of things. One, if they have not listened to the programs you've already said, but all of the transcripts for all of the Stand in the Gap Today radio programs are available free, downloaded by going to the website and uh, under the radio tab. You can find all of these principles, one through ten. And, and next Monday, this coming Monday, actually, we are going to be covering principle number ten. That's going to be the virtuous education of the youth. So all of them can be found there. And then shortly, we will be telling people how they can actually access um, a booklet that we're putting together that will have these in a very colorful, nicely done fashion that they can read for themselves and hand out to others. We call it a roadmap for renewal, 10 principles to national renewal, God's plan to a blessed nation, all different ways of looking at the same thing. It's truth. Well, thank you, Sam. There's so much information there, standinthegapmedia.org and on our app. And, and you mentioned transcripts. That's something I forgot about. You can read the transcripts or you can listen to our archives, which you can do with them in a little bit fast forward. So, you don't, you know, it goes a little bit quicker even. But we have a lot of questions to ask you, Sam, uh, today on the program on Ask Sam. So we're going to take a brief time out, hear from our partners and come right back on Stand in the Gap today. Christian parents want their children to excel in spiritual growth and educational achievement. Both are essential for future success in an increasingly complex world full of moral and economic challenges. BJU Press Materials place great value on the knowledge of God in His works. They teach critical thinking skills your child will need to get along both now and in the future. BJU Press Materials are available for grades K-12. to From the earliest grades, they teach biblical Christianity as a system of God-revealed truths. BJU Press Materials 
are well written, grade level appropriate, and biblically integrated. Teachers Editions assure that instructors have the plans and extra tools to keep your child engaged and excited about learning by teaching your child how to analyze, evaluate, and ultimately create new solutions. And that's just what today's workplace is looking for. If you're a Christian school teacher or administrator, a homeschool teacher, or a parent who just wants your child to learn more, start by exploring the BJU Press website. Visit BJUPress.com. That's BJUPress.com. For years, faithful Christians formed nonprofit foundations or trusts to preserve their ability to generously give to their favorite causes or ministries, even after their death. The problem? Professional managers, pressure from left-wing agendas, and even family members with opposing views hijacked the original donor intent. This is sad, but true. But this subversion of purpose can be prevented. Hello, I'm Sam Rohr of the American Pastors Network, and I'm glad to recommend Capstone Legacy Foundation in Wayne, Pennsylvania, an experienced and capable Christian community foundation established to help you set up a ministry, a giving structure guaranteed not to be hijacked, or a place you can donate cash or non-cash assets like stocks, bonds, or property Capstone's designed to help you achieve immediate tax savings and give you needed time to decide how to prayerfully allocate your giving. Contact Capstone at 610-688-8890 or visit them at capstonelegacy.org. This is Tim Barton from Wall Builders with another moment from American history. In 1963, the United States Supreme Court decided that voluntary Bible reading could no longer be part of the school day. Founding Father Benjamin Rush, known as the father of public schools under the Constitution, pointedly warned that the Bible should be read in schools in preference to all other books. He specifically warned that if America ever ceased promoting biblical principles in schools, then we would waste so much time and money in punishing crimes and take so little pains to prevent them. He was right. We now have 7 million Americans in prison, on probation or on parole, and the United States has the highest incarceration rate in the world. Sadly, this was unnecessary, but is the result of no longer teaching the morals of the Bible in schools. For more information about the Founding Fathers' views on the positive impact of the Bible in schools, go to wallbuilders.com. People often say, don't judge me, but are what they really saying is, God, don't tell me what to do. In God's plan, blessings or judgment hinge on fearing God and keeping His commands. Hello, I'm Sam Rohr with another Stand in the Gap Minute. This week we've looked at examples of national blessings turned to national judgment. As God said in Deuteronomy 28, 1 and 2, Fear me and keep my commandments and my blessings will overtake you. But he says in Deuteronomy 28, 15, Disobey me and my cursings will overtake you. The choice was clear to Israel and should be to us. Lender or borrower, leader or follower, freedom or bondage, feast or famine respect or shame, head or tail. America was founded by people who believed God, God blessed. Today we've forgotten God and God's turned blessing to judgment, just as he said. The sooner God's people look to him and live holy lives, the sooner God's blessings can return. Discover more at AmericanPastorsNetwork.net. You're listening to Stand in the Gap today. For more information, visit our website at StandInTheGapRadio.com. Welcome back. Uh, this Friday, we're doing our Ask Sam. So um, it's uh, Sam and Isaac coming to you here from Stand in the Gap today uh, with our questions for Sam. And um, so, Sam, in, in this segment, I want to get into this idea. Uh, we talked about, you know, national renewal, the 10 steps that you've been talking about and that a lot of our listeners have really been responding well to. Um, but I, I want to talk about um, a need for a new reformation and uh, and that could lead to national revival. And so before I go much further, um, I just want to play um, a couple of clips. I'll play one clip and get your response to it, and then an, another one, um, but from Ken Ham. And these clips come from when he was on Stand in the Gap TV with us a while back. And it, the program, and, and any of our listeners can go back and listen to these archives or um, different things, watch it. But uh, it was um, the, the program was titled Fighting for Our Life, the Church in the Western World. And uh, that our guest was Ken Ham, and he was explaining um, to us how we how we can see revival in America in our churches by a new Reformation. So, Tim, could you go ahead and play that that first clip? Is there a return? Can we see a strengthening? What does God's word say about the church and what the church needs to do in a time like we're seeing today? 
Well, you know, I've um, often listened to sermons by, say, Martin Lloyd-Jones and uh, read uh, articles dealing with, you know, revival in the past, because we've seen revivals in various places uh, in history. And one of the things that I would say as is, is this, you can't have a revival without what I would call uh, a reformation, a new reformation. If you think about the reformation, it was really a call to the church to return to the authority of the word of God. And what I believe is we need a new reformation to call the church back to the authority of the word of God. Uh, all right. So, Sam, um, would like to get your comment, you know, as the, the president of the American Pastors Network and dealing with so many different pastors and church groups and things. Um, what what do you think about what he said there about our need for the, the Church of America, the entire, you know, American church system to completely return back to the authority of Scripture? That's what he means by Reformation. What um, what what could you say about that? Well, you know what, Isaac, um, Ken was right. You, we were on that program together. Uh, we talked about it afterward. But I think I think Ken went right to the heart of it, and and that's something we talk about a lot. There, another one of our guests we've had on is Dr. George Barna. And our listeners right now, if they listen, they they know we have George on every month, and we relate uh, research information. Well, one of the things that we've highlighted for several years is that in the pulpit of America, the, those who would say they are evangelical pastors, only about 30 percent actually believe that the Word of God is authoritative. Now, that's a, that's a startling thing, about 30 percent. Now, what that means is that doesn't mean the 70 percent of the pulpits of America don't believe that the Bible is a nice book, but that's about all they believe it is. It's a good book, but they don't believe it's all true. Well, if you don't believe the Bible is all true, the practical aspect of it then is, well, then who determines what is truth? Well, by default, it's mankind who determines. And of course, that's what we talk about a lot uh, on this program. The humanistic worldview says, who needs God? God, we can determine what is true. And so, if you don't believe the Word of God is all true, well, well then why preach the parts that are, well, a little more controversial or don't fit the, the mold of a politically correct culture? Well, that's exactly what's been happening. Then, I think just a couple of weeks ago, when I had Dr. George Barna on the program, the, the most recent information would say that in America, 69%, 70% of all Americans say they are Christian. 35% say they are born again. 28% say they are evangelical Christians. But of that 28% evangelical and 35% who say they're born again, you know, Isaac, of that group, but 70% of them do not believe that the Word of God is authoritative. So there you come back to the real heart. So I think Ken Ham is exactly correct. And, and until we believe and agree with God that He is God and that His Word is what God says it is, true, enduring, unchanging, until we do that, God's not God, we're God, and there can be no reformation, no renewal, certainly no repentance, unless God is back on the throne and we're off of it. So it starts with how we view God's Word. So if, if you're praying for revival, it starts in the Bible. It starts in your personal devotions, and, and uh, let the Lord work in your heart to show you if you truly are putting His Word first as authority or not, and then use that and ask questions. That's what George Barna does and says for, for us to do. Ask people questions about what they really believe, and you might be shocked what you find out. Um, well, following up to that, Sam, I want to have uh, Tim play another real quick clip, um, a little bit over a minute and a half here, where uh, Ken Ham discusses the difference between the symptoms of the problem and the foundational root problem itself. Tim, if you could go ahead and play that clip. You know, the church right now is sort of like many Christians in the culture. Many many Christians in the culture look at issues like gay marriage, abortion, racism as the problems in the culture. But they're not the problems, they're the symptoms of the problem. The problem is a foundational issue that people are building their uh, worldview on man's word, not God's word. And, you know, in the church, uh, people are trying to deal 
with the symptoms in the sense of, oh, we're losing young people from the church. What do we do? So they, you know, increase the music and increase the entertainment and uh, that sort of thing. And what has happened is the church, in a way, has become very secularized. What I say is this. Our generations need answers. They need to know they can trust the Bible. In fact, we have people today in the younger generations don't know what the Bible is. In fact, when you ask most of the older generation, explain what the Bible is, where it came from. How do you know it's the word of God? How do you answer these skeptical questions that undermine God's word? There's been an incredible lack of teaching of apologetics in our churches Mm -hmm. and a lack of teaching foundationally. In other words, the Bible is not just a guidebook to life. It's not just a book you add to your thinking. Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation for all of our doctrine, for marriage, for having the right worldview in regard to abortion or dealing with racism or why you wear clothes, uh, with everything, the whole gospel. And until the church understands that they need a worldview based on God's word, based on Genesis 1 to 11, and therefore know what they believe and why they believe what they do, and equipped with answers to the skeptical questions that attack and undermine God's word in today's world, the church is not going to be affected. And and Sam, I I remember that interview we had with Ken Ham, and it was... um... You know, sometimes I found myself kind of chuckling some of the things he talked about. You know, he says everything from racism to why you need to wear clothes. And I'm like, oh, wow, you know, this is is discussed in the Bible. But when you think about our country, Martin Luther King Jr., he he said that we are all one blood. He got that from the Bible. Um, And so uh, he's right. We we need to go back to the Bible for the, the heart difference and the root problems. But why, um, why do you think, uh, Sam, it's so important, as Ken was pointing out on this program, and again, real quickly, um, the name of that program was Fighting for Our Life, the Church in the Western World. That was part one. There was a part two where we talk about the family in the Western world. But Sam, um, why is it so important that we know the difference between what are just the symptoms, and we, we need to look at those symptoms, but also what those are pointing to as the foundational or root problems that are causing those symptoms? Well, Isaac, because it goes right to the heart of what God says. Um, God says that our biggest problem is a sin problem. (laughs) And that's what our founders, William Penn, in our 10 principles, understand the nature and the role of God, perfect judge, creator, uh, sustainer, uh, sovereign. And then what about the nature of man? Well, According to the Bible, according to God, the nature of man is that he's fallen. Of course, that takes you right back to the beginning of Genesis that Ken was talking about. Sin entered the world, precipitated by a real live devil, and man doubted God. And Eve said, well, maybe I could be like God. And Adam said, well, I'm going to stand with you, Eve, and not with God. And all right, now we have our problem. But you see, that takes us back to the heart. That's God's view. But Why wouldn't someone, other than the fact we don't want to believe God, driven by the devil, who did not want to believe God, those who want to know the truth are going to go back to the Word of God, to the beginning, Genesis, which is what Ken just said, God is, God created, created man in his image, man doubted God and said, I want to be like God, fell, sinned, entered the world, and then God came in with his plan of redemption. And said to the devil, all right, I'm going to have your head crushed by the heel of one that I'll send. And that's Jesus Christ, who then can bring mankind fallen and without any life redeemed and brought back to him. You know, that is, that is the history. That is the gospel. That is God's love and God's justice manifested in the person of Jesus Christ. That is life. That is the Bible. And so there is no ability to go to the real fixing of a problem, which comes back to a sin problem, unless we go back and begin to look at it God's way. Otherwise, we just chase symptoms. As Ken said, we talk about it a lot. You can chase symptoms all day long. The problems of riding in the streets is, well, is that a problem that somebody didn't grow up right and have a good neighborhood? No, it's called sin. Uh, or people becoming dependent on drug usage. Is that just a a drug problem that comes and forces itself on somebody? No, it's a sin problem because people are searching for hope and they don't go the right place. So every time it is a matter of going back to the root problem in the scripture is what talks to us in root terms. And, you know, when we get to the heart of these issues, then it's the heart of man 
And as, as Ken pointed out then, to have a true reformation, personal reformation to bring this national revival, we have to go back and take the Bible as authoritative, as the final authority, as the ultimate authority. Um, so Sam, as we attempt to do that every day on this program on Stand in the Gap, uh, it, it's just refreshing to hear you know someone like Ken Ham say that's refreshing for me to hear you explain this, Sam, very helpful. We have more questions. Um, in fact, we have a pretty tough question for you about uh, war, maybe re even revolt. Uh, when we come back from this brief timeout, we want to take a quick timeout and we'll be right back on Stand in the Gap today. Thank you, Sam, and thank you to the team that you have working with you. I'll tell you one thing about your show. You accomplish more in less time to advance the gospel and to advance knowledge and understanding of seriously any radio show I know of. So congratulations. Those kind words from Congressman Michelle Bachman summarize what our guests say about Stand in the Gap today. This is Sam Rohr. On this program, we bring honest analysis of today's news to you and millions of Americans every day. With a newspaper in one hand and the Word of God in the other, we connect the dots between what's happening and what God says about what's happening in light of the Bible and the Constitution. From the mouths of our co-hosts, all preachers, whether former members of the House of Representatives or an evangelist to a millennial pastor or a senior pastor of 40 years, Stand in the Gap today is here for you. Unique, current, trustworthy. Pray for us. Stand with us financially by going to StandInTheGapRadio.com. Americans are a freedom-loving people. Wouldn't it be great if you could carry a copy of the essential documents that outline our freedoms written by our nation's founders in your pocket so you can refer to it every day? Well, now you can. Stand in the Gap Radio has found something you're sure to like, the Patriot's Essential Liberty Pocket Guide. The handy guide is a slim six and a half by three and a half inches, yet it includes the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution, the preamble to the Bill of Rights, and other influential documents, including, in the words of our founders, topical quotes from America's founders, plus a listing of online resources for further research by the serious-minded or the just plain curious. To see and request your copy of the Patriot's Essential Liberty Pocket Guide and make your tax-deductible gift of any amount, go to AmericanPastorsNetwork.net. That's AmericanPastorsNetwork.net. Let us hear from you today. Thank you, and God bless you. Dinosaur legends? This is Ken Ham, hoping you'll visit our spectacular Creation Museum west of the Cincinnati airport. China has a calendar that features dogs, rats, monkeys, and dragons. The explorer Marco Polo wrote about serpents in China with short legs and claws. What's with these stories? Well, could dragon legends actually be stories about dinosaurs? You see, according to the Bible's history, dinosaurs were created on the same day as people, so they must have lived alongside each other. As we show in our museum, dragon legends might have started out as real stories of people and dinosaurs. As they were passed down, the stories were exaggerated into legends, but they reflect a real time in history when people walked with dinosaurs. Plan your visit to the High Tech Creation Museum and life-size Noah's Ark at the Ark Encounter when you go to our website at AnswersRadio.com. AnswersRadio.com. You're listening to Stand in the Gap today, discussing the pressing issues facing our culture from a biblical and constitutional perspective. Now let's rejoin our host. Well, thanks again for listening. I'm Isaac Crockett. And before I go back to uh, our Ask Sam program, where I ask Sam Rohr, the president of the American Pastors Network, uh, the different questions that have come in for him, um, I want to ask Tim. Uh, Tim Schneider is our program producer and I just want to see if Tim is is there uh, listening and able to speak and maybe give us some quick ministry updates of what's going on at Stand in the Gap Media and American Pastors Network. Isaac, I am listening, and I am ready to go. So, hey, everybody. Hope you're having a great Friday. Just want to let you know about some things that are happening behind the scenes. We were talking a little bit before the break about time. We all don't have a lot of it. 
and a lot of times we were talking about listening to podcasts at about one and a half to two times the speed that you can normally listen to something because it helps speed up things and it helps us get more things done in a faster amount of time. Well, do you ever find yourself too busy to listen to a whole Stand in the Gap Today show? We're about 55 minutes long, each show is, but do you find yourself too busy to ever listen to all that? Well, did you know that we have shorter audio segments of between two and 11 minutes covering various topics that we discuss on our Stand in the Gap Today radio show? We call these podcast Q&As, and these are podcast segments, which are good for those who desire to hear a short segment on a certain topic. We have topics such as cultural issues, biblical worldview, the Constitution, Islam, finances, and so many more, healthcare, whatever. We have so many podcasts. We actually have over 3,000 podcast Q&As that you can listen to, these short 2 to 11 second or minute segments. Then you can go and find the whole show in our archives if you desire. You can check out our podcast Q&As on our app and at our website, standinthegapmedia.org. Very good resource. Highly encourage you to check that out. Also, did you know that we are on all the major podcast spotting form platforms here? The, the Let's try this again. Instead of spotting platforms, they're called, um, I don't even know what the word is for it. Anyway, but we're, we're broadcasting on all those. You can subscribe to them. Streaming platforms, there's the word I'm thinking of. That We are available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, tune in all of these podcast platforms. You can tune in and listen to hear truth from us every day. Sign up for our podcast, and as they're downloaded to your smart device, every time a new podcast is loaded, you will get it. Additionally, for a subscriber to our podcast, through Apple Podcast or Google Podcast or one of these other platforms, please make sure you rate us. Ratings will allow other like-minded individuals to find us as they search for podcasts, and we say thank you in advance for the ratings. Also, we have two great websites, AmericanPastorsNetwork.net and StandInTheGapMedia.org. Please go over there and check those out. On our StandInTheGapMedia.org, we have lots of our broadcast archives. Just talking a little bit about the Ken Ham program, you can find that over there on Stand in the Gap TV, and you can also find our radio programs over there too. Also on AmericanPastorsNetwork.net, you have an opportunity to sign up for our e-newsletter. Please consider signing up for it to help you be informed about things that are happening here at the American Pastors Network. So, Isaac, I'm going to go ahead and send it on back to you, and thank you for giving me the opportunity. Well, Tim, thank you so much for um, just letting us know those different things going on. I oftentimes forget about it. I use certain ones, but not all of them, and uh, depending on what your situation is, what you're, um, you know, what you use and what you um, are comfortable with, we have all kinds of different opportunities out there, and and Sam and I have been talking a lot, uh, reading letters that come in to us or um, emails that come our way or comments on social media, just super encouraging for us here at Stand in the Gap Media to see how the Lord is using uh, the truth and the teachings from a biblical worldview to impact lives, and many of you are sharing stories of how you've shared some of this information or how to uh, access these programs with other people, friends and people from church or family members, and that's gotten them uh, being a part of it. And so we're, we're not a very large ministry. God has given us a very large footprint uh, as far as what we're able to see Him do um, and the places this goes out to, but it's a very small financially. Uh, our operating expenses are very small. Our group is very small, and so we are just so excited to see what God is doing every time that you're praying for us or giving us feedback or sending in uh, financial assistance to us. It goes a really long ways, and uh, we really are, are excited about what God is doing and how He's using so many of you uh, who are listening and praying for us. So thank you for that, and uh, I know, Sam, you, you feel the same way about it. Um, and speaking of, of listening and feedback, uh, Sam, I think Amy was sharing with us one of the questioner, uh, questioner, listener questions that came in uh, in the feedback forms that we thought would be good on the program today. And, and it was um, a person was asking about war. He, he used the word war. And uh, basically he said, you know, when is it right to use war as a method to overthrow an evil t tyranny, uh, such as, you know, an example he gave, I think, was our founding fathers, what they did here in America and uh, I, I think the, what the question was getting at wasn't so much is there righteous warfare, but is there a time to revolt? And I know, Sam, that you talk a lot about there's a fine line between resistance and rebellion. There's a difference between um, a revival that brings change and a revolt that rebels, and, um, and it gets complicated. Uh, my grandfather w went through 
uh, the socialist uh, it was called nazis it's it was a socialist party of germany that they took over holland and he was in holland and he was part of the dutch underground resistance movement and so um, I think many people are wondering, Sam, you know, what kind of resistance should there be towards unjust tyranny and, you know, to what extent, um, things like that. And so I, I was wondering what you could say to Christians especially. Uh, would there be a time to, to have a resistance? Would that look, you know, what would that look like? Would that look like bearing arms? I know uh, some of our forefathers were nonconformist churchmen who went to prison or left the country um, because of what happened, and others uh, took up arms. So it, it doesn't all fall, fall under the same category, um, but what kind of biblical advice could you give to those wondering mm-hmm. about these issues? Well, Isaac, you've posed a question that I can assure you right now we cannot deal with <laughs> fully uh, in just a couple of minutes. Um, I'll try to give a couple of principles because this is a fundamental one, and it goes back uh, really to Uh, many today in our culture who will state, and there are many who would call themselves Christians, or religious at least, um, who would find fault with our founding fathers, those who signed the Declaration of Independence as an example, and say they were wrong because they rebelled against the king, and uh, and therefore they were out from under God's uh, authority. All right, now I don't happen to believe that, uh, I, I, I've studied that very, very closely, uh, what their thinking was and how they precipitated and did what they did. Uh, but I'll just suffice and say, no, without a doubt, those founders who worked through and those who signed the Declaration of Independence and decided at that time to oppose the King of England, um, I believe were on strong uh, biblical grounds. But here, here is where I would put in. Rebellion, we know in Scripture, started with the devil himself against God. So rebellion has at its root an attitude towards God. If God is not in the picture for an individual that fights against God-ordained authority, and all authority is God-ordained, by the way, and we've talked much in this program about that, But a person who fights against and says, I don't like that which is happening, and they strike out in defiance of whatever the authority is, is, and God is not a part of their thinking process, I'm telling you, it's rebellion. And God hates it. And God judged rebellion in the Old Testament with death. It was, it's serious. So we have to understand uh, the concept of authority, and it's just like in the last segment. It starts with are we under authority to God's Word? Uh, I would not follow the lead of someone who has no fear of God. And I, and I think as individuals, God, give, God gives us direction in His Word. So we have to be under authority to God. And any person who says, I am going to take up arms, uh, or, and wh- however that would be, and there's times when that can be done and so forth, it has to be, it has to be evaluated first of all. Um, why am I doing this? Where is God in this picture? Am I doing this for me because I'm uncomfortable, or am I doing this on behalf of advancing clearly defined biblical truth? All right, that, that's one. So you got to start there. That's why we're going to go. That's why you have to go back to Scripture. Number one. Number two, uh, I, I think is, is this concept: the Scripture. We must believe the Scripture does give us counsel for all matters of life and living. We talk about that. But again, it's going back to Scripture. Does the Scripture give instruction in how to respond in uh, times of tyranny uh, to the Christians under the Roman Empire, to the Jewish people under captivity in Babylon? The answer is yes, it does. So we have to go back again and refresh ourselves and say, what does God's Word say? So here's another, I'm not sure how far we'll be keep going, but here's here's another one. We must always be under authority. Our founders understood that just to rebel against the the, the king of England, if it wasn't done right, would be guilty of rebellion. So individually, they did not do it. And again, this is another principle we talk about. We talked about in this program just recently, a couple days ago, actually, 
uh, there is a doctrine called the doctrine of lesser magistrates. It's the understanding of biblical authority coming out of Romans 13. God is on top. God gives authority to the individual. Then there is the family, mom and dad, and their, their area of jurisdiction. And then there's civil authority, and they have duties, and then there's the church authority. All of these work together perfectly in God's plan. The problem is, if you don't understand that, and most of America doesn't understand that, then to just say, I'm just going to fight to make my way known— is most likely to be rebellion. It has to work together. Our founders, before they made that declaration, they appealed to the God of heaven, and they went from there, and so they were under authority, Isaac, and they proceeded that fashion. It was not rebellion for them. And, and before we take this break, I just do want to add the resource there that you can go online and look at our archives, look at the transcripts, or listen to uh, Matt Chuella. Uh, you've interviewed several times, Sam and uh, this idea of the doctrine of lesser magistrates, if you'll look that up on our website. Um, Sam, those would be, I think, some good resources. Uh, well, we're going to take a, another time out, and we're going to come back on Standing the Gap today, Ask Sam with our final questions for Sam Roar. Family, commerce, civil authority, the church, did you know these are the four pillars of society that God ordained to be the distributors, demonstrators, and protectors of truth? It's time to raise the biblical standard for each of these institutions once again. The American Pastors Network and its media ministries, Stand in the Gap Radio and TV, are using their national platform to analyze and evaluate today's cultural issues from a biblical and constitutional perspective. When you tune into Stand in the Gap today, or watch an episode of Stand in the Gap TV, you'll hear information ranging from the latest news headlines to the exciting fulfillment of prophecy in the Middle East. Guests like former Congresswoman Michelle Bachman, apologist Alex McFarland, and Citizens Council for Health Freedom's Twyla Brace offer insights from their valuable experience to help you better understand and defend your faith. To tune in, visit us at standinthegapmedia.org. That's standinthegapmedia.org. Although the term Christian education doesn't occur in the Bible, it does speak of the moral and spiritual instruction of children. It places a high value on knowledge, both of God and His works. It describes the moral and spiritual fruits of this knowledge and defines its ultimate purpose, the growth of your child in godliness of character and action. That's why we suggest you consider BJU Press K-12 materials. Your child's a unique individual created for a specific purpose. Proper education that includes the Bible and the relational influence of godly teachers produces a pure heart and a willing mind. The Bible calls that success. BJU Press materials are well-written, grade-level appropriate, and biblically integrated. They teach critical thinking skills and keep your child engaged and excited about learning. If you're a Christian school teacher or administrator, a homeschool teacher, or a parent who just wants your child to learn more, start by exploring the BJU Press website. Visit BJUPress.com. That's BJUPress.com. Here's Twyla Braze with today's Health Freedom Minute. A cash-based pharmacy called Freedom Pharmacy opened in Ohio in early 2021. As a direct-to-consumer pharmacy, it does no business with any third parties. It offers generic drugs and provides compounding options. It offers low prices because it's outside of the system. No middlemen are involved. As the Ohio Capital Journal notes, if you buy a generic with insurance, the copayment is often more than what the entire higher price would be. One Ohio patient had been paying a $141 copayment for a generic drug, but when she switched to cash, the price was only $23.05, six times less. Freedom Pharmacy owner Nate Hux says this simple exchange allows him to be a better pharmacist because it pays him only to practice his profession. Help us secure health freedom for all. Visit cchfreedom.org. That's cchfreedom.org. China bans video games for minors. For the Colson Center, I'm John Stone Street with The Point. Recently, Chinese authorities announced that minors can only play video games three hours a week and not on school days. Of course, that kind of thing would never happen in the West for all kinds of reasons, not least of which is that we worship individual autonomy. We can't even pass real restrictions on known dangers like violent pornography or Instagram. In a communist vision, on the other hand, individuals and their freedom are dispensable. After all, video games are really addicting, and a generation of young men lost in fantasy worlds can't serve the 
the state. Banning video games, that's a small step for a nation that already tracks faces, encourages snitching through a social credit system, and sends police right to your location if you ever violate protocol. Humans are neither mere parts of a community nor autonomous individuals. The only worldview that can sustain freedom recognizes who we really are. Moral agents, entitled to and responsible for our decisions, and members of communities, responsible to and for others that Jesus called our neighbors. I'm John Stone Street. You're listening to Stand in the Gap today. For more information, visit our website at standinthegapradio.com. Welcome back to uh, the last part of our program today of Ask Sam. And uh, Sam, on the, on the last segment, I asked you a really difficult question. I guess not, not a difficult question, but a hard one to answer in a short period of time uh, that had come in from a listener about um, really at the heart of it was how do we resist tyranny? And uh, they'd use the word war, um, but, you know, it conjures up a lot of different things. But uh, you, you were going in through biblical examples and things of, of when and how, uh, you know, we resist evil, really, uh, at the heart of it. And, and that re- kind of reminded me of an article. I think uh, Tim had shared it with me first, and now I've seen it in several other news places and uh, the, the, one of the articles, uh, headlines about this was it, it was a high school football team. And it just happened recently, I think, in the state of Tennessee. And on uh, CBN, they have an article. And here's the, the, the name of the article was Satan's power was defeated tonight. Tennessee high school football team defies school board holds post game prayer. And basically, uh, the school had said, look, you know, um, some atheists had come and threatened to sue them if they kept having a post game prayer on the field led by uh, the coach or teachers. And so the, the school board had said, look, we can't do that anymore. And so the students themselves and maybe some parents got together and they went ahead and prayed on the field. And uh, so Sam, I, you know, as we look at things like that, it, it, where a team defies uh, tyranny, so to speak, they resist. Um, what is your reaction to what these students and their families were doing? And, and I don't know if there's time to get into it, maybe other ways that we can be involved uh, in changing our local public schools or government schools, you know, um, but I just just like to get your reaction on that, uh, Isaac. In a, in, a, in a couple of ways, one, one as as people who fear God, and probably most of our listeners would be in that category. Uh, if we fear God, and we keep His commandments, which is exactly what. Ecclesiastes twelve thirteen says Solomon says let me hear the whole duty let me let me just consider everything all considered in all of life what what do we do well fear God meaning lead to worship in God and keep His commandments this is the whole duty of man all right God is in charge we will either yield to His leadership and His definition of what should be or we will lead to our own or something of man. So their choice is where that is. Then after that, then if that's where we embrace as truth, then when there ever there is a conflict by any other lesser authority, a civil authority, a school board authority, anybody who tells us as individuals who have now our allegiance to the God of heaven, if they tell us to do something that is counter to what God says to do. In other words, God says you don't murder. If they, if the government comes back and says, no, that baby that's in the womb, we've determined that that baby is going to be disabled. You know, kill that baby in the womb, that kind of thing. Well, we would say absolutely not. We would defy that order. Why? Because a superior order, God's moral authority, would in fact be in place. So you say no to that. Now, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they found themselves in a political regime. Uh, the, the, the nation said, all right, you're going to bow. We got a national religion, and you're going to bow, and you're going to worship them, this, uh, this idol. And our listeners understand that. And they said, no, we won't. And everybody else knelt down, and they stood up. They just continued to stand. And they were put in the fire. But they, the, the key point was they said to him, we serve a higher authority, king. You have authority, but you are a lesser authority. God has already ruled in this matter. Thou shalt worship no other gods. We will not. So throw us in the fire. Our God can keep us if he wants, and if he not, then what? Well, we know the story of that. Daniel was told uh, the, the made a law, can't pray to any other God. He prayed, 
He ended up in the lion's den. All right, that's how we make our distinctions. When God says this is what we should do, then no other authority can tell us to do counter. And if we fall to that authority, it's like bowing to the idol. So we can't do that. Or on the other hand, if government or a lesser authority says you cannot do what God has said to do, for instance, go to church. We're told to gather ourselves together in worship. All right, well, if the government says, well, you can't go, we've seen a lot of that happening over these, during these COVID times. Well, what should be the response? No, you can't tell us what to do. The COVID injection is one. You're going to do this, or as a mandate, uh, or you can't get a job. But what's the believer's response who says, my body is not mine, it's God's. There's a moral issue involved here. I cannot do that. All right, well, then what is what's right to do? No, you resist and say, no, I have a higher duty and responsibility because God made my body and this thing, at least I don't know what it is, but if beyond that, it's actually changing my, my DNA. I can't do that. All right. That's how you enter in. Every decision that comes up, Isaac, must be measured in light of God's word, the authority uh, determined, and then we go to the higher authority. And if it ever comes to the fact where it tells us to say, well, you cannot do what God says to do, or you have to do what God says not to do, then our obligation under God, we serve God rather than man. And that's really the, where the beginning is. And then how you then oppose can become another matter. But whether or not we obey God can never be questioned. Well, and, and Sam, that brings up a really good point. I know you're going to discuss some of this um, on your last uh, step of the 10 Steps for National Renewal, but some of the young people who are listening to us or some of the parents of young people in government schools uh, are being put to the test, and they're being told, um, you know, you have to put this as the answer on the test, or, you know, this is what's right, or this is what, um, you know, what you're doing here is wrong. Uh, how, how could a young person in a government school today stand up and resist? And uh, how could a parent of a student, a school age student, uh, be involved in, in resisting some of these um, sinful things that are being pushed on our young people in the public schools? Well, I mean, if they're in a public school, the, the, the child, if the child is not questioning when the science teacher says, we came out of the slime of the earth, there is no God. Well, if the child ends up not actually ever engaging but just complying, and then answers the question on the test because he knows what the teacher is going to say is the right answer, but he puts down the wrong answer even though he knows it's wrong, they've got a problem because that's a, that's a, that's a matter of conviction. The, the child, in, in effect, is lying because he knows that's not the answer, but he knows what he's going to go do to get a good grade. These are thorny things. Ultimately, parents have to decide, like when we talk uh, regularly here on about Christian education, you know, it's, it's why there have been uh, 30 to 40 percent of parents over this last year who have had their children in public school said, I can't have them do that anymore. Put them into Christian education. Just had uh, Mike Smith from HSLD, Homes of Legal Defense, on their program just the other day, and he cited that in homeschooling across the country, Normally, it's about 3 million Americans, uh, or children that, that are involved in homeschooling. That number jumped to about 6 million this year, Isaac. So people are making decisions. One way of resisting is do engage, but also not, not complying, not, not, not lying just to get a right answer. Uh, it's really, for many, it's saying, right, what do we need to do? And for many, that, and for, for many making this decision. No, I'm going to put them in a Christian school where they're not forced to lie or being taught lies, or I'm going to homeschooling at home and teach them because at least I know what's going into the head, and ultimately I'm responsible as a parent. So multiple ways of getting around it, but complying or agreeing with a lie just to get a good grade, that, 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 that doesn't cut it before God. Amen. Last question, real fast question, Sam. Would you uh, close us real quickly in prayer as we come to the end of our program? Absolutely. Heavenly Father, we are thankful to you, O Lord, that you, uh, you give us all of the answers to all that we need. And the pressures of this life, they're different now for us, but in many regard, they're the same because it's only a spiritual conflict, and it's a matter of who is truth and where are we going to fall. Are we going to bow before the God of heaven? Are we going to bow before the God of this world? Lord, help our listeners to bow before the God of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Well, Sam, 
Uh, thank you so much for all of the help and all the input you've given us today. Those of you listening, thanks for listening. Please listen to our weekend program or download our app and listen on Stand in the Gap. Thanks for listening. Stand in the Gap wherever you are today. If you like today's program, tell a friend. You'll also want to hear Stand in the Gap Weekend and watch the nationally syndicated Stand in the Gap TV program. We present the news of the day truthfully, carefully, and consistently from a biblical worldview and constitutional perspective. If you're hungry for the truth, visit StandInTheGapMedia.org to find all our programs and the stations that carry them. While you're there, be sure to download our free app and support this ministry with your best financial gift. Then join us again right here Monday through Friday for another program of Stand in the Gap Today.